Hi, we're here with Antero Garcia. Antero teaches English at a public high school in South Central Los Angeles. Using his classroom as a hub of youth participatory action research, Antero and his students jointly create and assess the needs of their South Central community. As a doctoral candidate, at the Urban Schooling Division of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Antero's research focuses on developing critical literacies and civic identity through the use of mobile media and gameplay in formal learning environments. In 2008, Antero co-developed the Black Cloud Game, a digital media and learning competition award recipient the Black Cloud provoked students to take real-time assessment of air quality in their community. And Taro is co-editing an upcoming special issue of Learning Media and Technology and a member of the MBTS committee that is reviving, resi revising ELA standards. And Taro contributes to DML Central and the National Writing Project's Digital LS. Updates and further musings can be found on his blog, The American Crawl. So, and Tara, we're, we're talking here about DML Central 2012, and, and you're in particular, what is your sub-theme for that conference? So the sub-theme I'm working on is called Innovations in Public Education, um, and the focus here really is on what's happening in schools, and particularly public schools across America and internationally. Um, so my focus is really on the fact that um, all of this technology and all of these really cool things that are happening with digital media are really cool, but unless they're impacting um, very traditional things that are debated in, in um, the world of education, like the achievement gap, um, they're really not all that useful for us right now. So my, my concern is how are we going to use this to impact traditionally marginalized youth, particularly um, black and brown students across America, um, English language learners, um, students in urban communities, students in rural communities, students who traditionally aren't getting the same kinds of educational needs um, as other students in, in the country. So how, how do you go about it? <laughs> right, that's, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, my own research, I've been looking at ways we can use um, things like cell phones, ways we can use low cost technology that students already have that, that is pretty much ubiquitous in schools, um, and that policies as they currently exist are, are really kind of limiting. Um, that you know, students get in trouble for using cell phones, or that um, filters and acceptable use policies are essentially banning the types of practices that um, our research has shown works in you know informal, non-academic settings. But when we put it into schools, then we get into um, issues of cyberbullying and issues of hoping students don't see something they're not supposed to see at the age when they're 13, but they're probably already seeing when they're at home with their friends, anyways, right? And so this is really an opportunity for us to think about how are we going to engage these students. Um, and really teach them the types of responsible uses um, of technology that, that we're using every day. So when I'm, when I'm outside of my classroom or even when I'm in my classroom, I'm on my, I'm on my cell phone all the time. Right? It's, it's just part of how I function as a professional adult. Um, but we're, we're sending a message, message to our students that um, anytime you use your cell phone, you need to do it discreetly and you need to hide and, and it's a bad. Um, and you know, so this is just one example of you know, where my research in, is in terms of how are we going to bring um, digital media into uh, a public education setting. Well, I know this is a topic that's that's awakening uh, any educator out there who's paying attention to this because to them mostly it's a problem. Um, yeah. How how do we deal with this problem? Is one issue. The other issue, which I I, th I think is you know unfortunately today a, a smaller number of educators like yourself are dealing with. How how do we use the tools that all of our students are carrying or the, the communication devices in, in pursuit of learning. So some examples how, for, for the other teachers out there who are grappling with this, what, what can you tell them about how you can, you can turn the students' attitudes around or, or use those technologies in pursuit of what you want to get done in the classroom? Yeah, I mean, I think because it's almost so unheard of to allow students, at least in my school setting, um, to use things like cell phones that when I told them that we could, um, it was like a, a light went off, and the students who typically don't engage, they, they automatically, you know, were, were into just trying something because of the fact that they're now doing similar writing, academic writing that we would do in an English classroom, but now they got to tap on a, on a small screen that, for me, drives me nuts because my thumbs are, are very clumsy, but for them, you know, it's second nature for them. 
Um, and so um, for students, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's easy, it's easy to get students. The hard thing is um, trying to get through the rhetoric that adults use to cloud um, pedagogical practice in classrooms. So um, what I've noticed, though, is we have an identity problem as, as an educational community. If you look at school policy and district policy, oftentimes it's very different um, and runs counter to the types of policies and statements that are coming out from state departments of education and the U.S. Department of Education in terms of what we're saying about technology, right? So if you look at large statements from people like Arne Duncan or Barack Obama, they're all about, they're very pro-technology. It's about innovation. Um, and then if you start looking closer at the nitty-gritty of what states are saying and what um, my own school district is saying, um, there, there are very explicit policies in place that are blocking our opportunities for innovation. And I, I get that there's plenty of concerns and reasons for that to happen, um, but until we start looking at these and thinking more creatively about how to innovate, um, then we're, we're really kind of limiting ourselves in terms of how we're going to move forward in terms of education. This sounds great in theory. Uh, what Can you give a couple of examples in, in practice that, you know, teachers out there who are, who are not really immersed in it, what yeah. can they do? What, what have you done that others could do? Yeah, so um, I've actually created an alternate reality game in my classroom. Um, where students are, are communicating with Anansi, the uh, West African folklore character, the spider, um, to create their own stories in and around their community. Um, and so they're using cell phones and they're creating QR codes. And other than QR codes, which, you know, there's the, they're little boxy um, barcodes in case people don't know what they are. Um, other than creating those, we weren't doing things that were that difficult on a phone. I think a lot of times when you talk about technology, um, Teachers are, are afraid because our expertise might not necessarily be in technology or it's in literacy or it's in mathematics. Um, but other than creating these QR codes, we weren't doing much more than texting, taking photographs, things that everyone that is pretty intuitive on these types of devices. So it's an easy device or easy program that could scale over to other teachers. Um, and as we did this, we essentially engaged in critical literacy acquisition. Um, we we created narratives around our community. We documented. Um, we, we um, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of blinking. Um, we also uh, basically established critical literacy research um, for for our community, and then shared this out publicly. So we created a scavenger hunt game where we're playing different types of games. Um, and this was all in the course of about six weeks. It was a short activity, um, but one that my students used. To, and and when I talked to them afterwards, um, they're much more critical of their community. They're much, they're much more cognizant of how they can use their phones as much more than social devices. Um, and they're looking forward to doing this kinds of re this kind of research in the future. Um, so that was just one activity that we did. Where is there a cookbook of such activities that exists, or are you creating one? Where would educators go to find out more about exactly what to do? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a large group of us that that are doing this kind of work. Um, one of the best places that I've looked is Digital Is. It's a it's a resource that the National Writing Project has created, um, and it's basically a hub where any teacher can kind of go online and share thinking that they have about digital literacies, thinking that they have about digital writing tools, um, and really just kind of solicit feedback, share the resources they have, look at collections that other people are creating, and it's it's just kind of an amazing resource for people across content and age areas. So that's, um, this digital is as an IS? Yeah, okay. exactly. Great, wonderful. Uh, Keep us informed about what, what you're doing, and, I, and I'm sure other teachers are going to be very interested in, in what to do with these things that are in their classroom, whether they like it or not. Yeah, I think, uh, as, as you mentioned, that I think my big goal for this conference is to really get as many teachers and even students as possible to um, engage in the conversation at DML. That, that's a really big group that I think it's important to have represented at this conference, so I'm excited to, to hear from any teachers out there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and, and good Thanks. luck. Thanks, Howard. I appreciate it.